This is assignment 7-3, number 1, f at x equals x cubed subtract 1, and g at x is the inverse of f at x, and then we're going to do a bunch of things. So in part a, can you find the inverse? That's what g at x is. So let's start there. So to find the inverse here, we're going to make this x equals y cubed subtract 1. The inverse x and y have been switched, and then you solve for y. So you're going to add 1, and then lastly you're going to do the cube root to get y by itself. And then once y is by itself, that is the inverse, we'll just call that g at x. So there's part A. In part B, it says graph both of them on the same graph. So let's do that. Just a sketch will do. Kind of straight. <laughs> so if I want to graph f at x, it's x cubed subtract 1. So go down to negative 1 and then draw x cubed. And then this is a cube root of x plus 1. So that's 1 to the left. And then draw a cube root. Remember that these reflect on this line right here, right? So they reflect on the line y equals x. That's what makes them inverses if you fold over it. All right, just to remind myself that this is f at x, and that is g at x. We're rolling here. Part C, find the derivative of both of them. So the derivative of f is just 3x squared. And the derivative of g, a little bit more to it. Remember, we could write this as x plus 1 to the 1 third. The derivative would be 1 third. And then subtract 1 to the exponent. So it's 1 third, subtract 1. The, the hook on would be positive 1, so I don't need it. Part D. Uh, find the derivative at uh, uh, find the derivative at for f at one and for g at zero. So I want you to notice that negative one zero and zero negative one they are inverse points, right? And here's the relationship. So the derivative at positive 1, say positive 1 or negative 1. Make sure I did that right. Oh, right here. They're using these points. So 1, 0, and 0, 1. So the derivative at 1 would be 3 times 1 squared. And then if you do the inverse of that, or if you think the y-coordinate becomes the x-coordinate, this one up here, then now do that at g and plug in 0. Remember, 1 to any exponent is 1, so this answer is 1 third. And then the last part is, what do you notice about these two? And you should say they are reciprocals. And that's the relationship. So the derivative at a point, if you take the inverse and you inverse that point, then the derivatives are reciprocals. So let me give you a visual of that again. So we have a point 1, 0. The inverse of that point is 0, 1. This is f at x. This is g at x. The derivative at 1 was 3. Well, the inverse, the derivative at 0, is 1 third. 
And that's the relationship between a function and its inverse when you take the derivative. The keyword is reciprocals. Right, let's try it again, number two. f at x equals 3x subtract 1. Again, g at x is the inverse. We're doing the exact same questions almost. So let's just see if we can be efficient here. So step one is to find the inverse of this. So I'm going to go x equals 3y subtract 1. To get y by itself, you would add 1 and then divide everything by 3. That's g at x, which is the inverse. For part b, we're going to graph them. So if I graph the first one, 3x subtract 1, you'd start at negative 1 and go up 1, 2, 3, over 1. Draw your line. That's f at x. The second one, um, you can do the inverse of what you just saw. So instead of uh, 0, negative 1, you can go negative 1, 0. And instead of 1, 2, it could be 2, 1. could also apply the slope up 1 and over 3. And you can see the two lines. Again, they reflect on line y equals x. So you have the graphs of both. In part c, it says take the derivative of both. So the derivative of f is 3. The derivative of g, and you take the derivative here, it's 1 third. And because they're lines, the derivatives are constants. So what do you notice? These are reciprocals. So when it says, what's the derivative at 1? The answer is 3. What's the derivative at 0? The answer is 1 third. And the derivative at any point would have been 3, and the derivative of any point at g would have been 1 third because they're lines. And then what do you notice? That they are reciprocals. And again, if I try to give you a visual of this, um, you have f at x, which equals 3x subtract 1. The inverse of that is g at x, which we said was x plus 1 all divided by 3. So if we have a point, 1, 2, the inverse of that point is 2, 1. The derivative at 1 is 3. The derivative at 2 is 1 third. And what's the relationship here? They're reciprocals. Number 3. f at x equals the square root of x plus 1, and we're going to do the same thing over again. Here we go. So part a is to find the inverse. So we're going to go x equals the square root of y plus 1, and then find the inverse of that. So we're going to square both sides, and then we're going to subtract 1. Now, know there's a restriction here. So the domain here and the range. So the domain actually goes from negative 1 to 0, and the range goes from the k, the, the number added or subtracted at the end is 0. So it goes from 0 to infinity. And what's important is that this inverse now takes the domain of the range of the inverse. So the domain here goes from 0 to infinity when you graph it. So when we graph this together, This is part B. If you graph the square root of x plus 1, you move it 1 to the left and do a square root function. For this, x squared subtract 1, you start at negative 1, but you only do this part of the, the parabola. So this part on the left doesn't exist. It goes from 0 to infinity. So then the, the inverse is matched. So there is a domain restriction there. So there's the graph of them. In part C, it says take the derivative 
So if I take the derivative of f, that's 1 half x plus 1 to the negative a half. If I take the derivative of g, that's just 2x. And then whatever point they give you, go back here. So the derivative at 3 and the derivative at 2. So the derivative at 3 3 plus 1 is 4. This is the square root of 4, but it's the reciprocal. So it's 1 quarter when you put it together. And then 2x, obviously, 2 times 2. And again, what do you notice about these? That they are uh, reciprocals. Again, if I give you a little visual, f of x equaled the square root of x plus 1. The inverse of that was um, x squared subtract 1. A point here that we used was 3. And 3 plus 1 is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. The inverse of 3, 2 is 2, 3. That's on this graph, which it is. And then the derivative at 3 was a quarter. The derivative at 2 was 4. So what do you notice? That these are reciprocals. So if you can kind of follow this path, the inverse and the calculus coming together. Number 4. Let f and g uh, be inverse functions. And now it just gives you some information. So we have a point for f, which is negative 1, 0. We have another point at 0, 1, and another point at 1, 3. So I'm going to write this out so I can see and feel this better. So these are points on f at x. If these are inverses, then on g at x, you would flip each point just so you see it. So that means the derivative at negative 1. Oh, did I flip this? Huh. There it's switched now. Not flipping, switching. So the derivative at negative 1 and the derivative at 0, reciprocals. The derivative at 0 and the derivative at 1, reciprocals. Derivative at 1, derivative at 3, reciprocals. Get the idea. And then it says the derivative at negative 1 is equal to 4 thirds. The derivative at 0 is 1 fifth. And the derivative at 1 is 2. Then I'll write down the questions. Then it says, find each of the following if possible. So some of them may not be possible because you don't have enough information. Here we go. So negative 1 is connected to g at 0. So the derivative at 0 is the reciprocal. The derivative at 0 is 1 fifth. That's here. So here at 0, it's 1 fifth. So the inverse is at 1. So g prime at positive 1 is the reciprocal, which is 5. The derivative at 1, which is the last point, is 2. The inverse would be the derivative for g at 3 would be the reciprocal. And the rest, we don't have enough information. Let's see how they write that down.
So we just write down what they said. So it's not possible. This one's also not possible. So if you can organize the information, it's a lot easier answering these questions. Number five. If f of 2 equals 3 and the derivative of 2 equals 4, find the inverse of it at 3. So let's just break this down. And if you can visualize it, it's a little bit better. So for the function, we have a point 2, 3. The inverse of that, the point would be 3, 2. So the derivative at 2 is 4. For the inverse at 3, then, would be the reciprocal, and that's the answer they're looking for. Number 6. Don't make it complicated. If 1, 2 is a point on f at x, then for the inverse, can you find the derivative at 2? So again, we're going to organize this. So f at x is that. So I need the derivative of f at x. So I'm going to write down 3x squared plus 2. That's the derivative. And then plug in positive 1 into that. So I took the derivative of f at x, and then I'm going to plug positive 1 into here and get 5. And because of that, for the inverse, What's the derivative of the inverse at 2? It's the reciprocal of that answer, so it's 1 fifth. Number 7. If f at x equals that, find the derivative of the inverse at 6. Let's break this down. So f at x equals x cubed, so subtract 4, You have to do a little more work on this one. So we're given a function. This is our goal right here. And so let's just break this down so I understand what's happening. So these are inverses, right? My goal is to find when the x coordinate is 6, what's the derivative? So if I inverse that, that means the y coordinate is 6 for f at x. So this is actually what I'm going to do first. And then I need to solve for x. And even in the answer key, it says guess and check. So like plug in positive 1, does it work? Plug in positive 2, does it work? So you can guess and check or use a calculator. So there's no obvious way to solve this equation. So what would happen if I plugged in 1 would obviously not work. How about 2? If I go 2 cubed, subtract 4, 2 to the negative 1, that would be 8 and 1 half. So that's 8 take away 2. So it does equal 6. So 2 works. If I plug in 2 for x, it gives me the answer 6. I could also use the calculator and solve the equation to get the answer 2. So I needed that value though. So now back here, I'm gonna take the derivative. That's three x squared plus four x uh, to the negative two. And now I'm gonna plug in positive two into this derivative. And then I'm gonna simplify it. 
so that's 12. That simplifies to 1, so that's 13. So the derivative, so obviously this is this. So we took the derivative at 2, and the answer is 13. So the derivative at 6 for the inverse would have to be the reciprocal of that answer, so it's 1 over 13. Number 8. And number 8, f at 2 equals 5. The derivative at 2 equals negative 2 thirds. And this is what then is the derivative at 5? Well, are we at the point now where you can see it's obvious? So, oh, does it say f and g are inverses? Yeah. All right. So if these are inverses, the inverse of this is 5, 2. So the derivative at 2 and the derivative at 5 are reciprocals if they're inverses. So this answer must be negative 3 over 2. For number 9, it can be that simple if you're understanding what's happening. So for this one, you're given a point 1, 2. So f at x and g at x are inverses. For f at x, you have a point 1, 2. So the inverse of 1, 2 is 2, 1. So the derivative at 1 is equal to the reciprocal of the derivative at 2. So what's the derivative of f at x? So for number 9, it would be 5x to the 4th plus uh, 6x squared. And then you're going to plug in 1 and get the answer 11. So therefore, the derivative at 2 is the reciprocal. And you have the answer. Number 10. For number 10, you have f at x equals e to the x subtract 2. Ooh, tricky. Um, the inverse of that would be a natural logarithm, but it actually doesn't matter. What does matter is this. Uh, if you're trying to find the in derivative inverse, make it equal to 1. So let's break this down. If the inverse of that is g at x, and the x-coordinate of that, because this is what I'm looking for, right? The derivative at 1, that's the x-coordinate. So if I go back the other way, that's the y-coordinate. And I need to find the x that goes with that y-coordinate. So I go 1 equals that. And then I solve that equation. Well, I can see that if x equals positive 2, 2 take away 2 is 0, and e to the 0, it's equal to 1. Some number sense. So that's the value I'm looking for. Take the derivative of f at x. That's e to the x subtract 2. So you And the hook on would be positive 1, so it stays that way. Plug in 2. That gives you the answer e to the 0, which is 1. So the reciprocal of 1 is 1. It stayed the same. So the derivative at 1 is also 1 because these are reciprocals. I don't know how to spell. Number 11. In number 11, for problems, what is it? It says, uh, find the derivative of f at x to find the largest interval in which f at x has an inverse. So it only has an inverse if it's monotonic. So it can only be increasing or decreasing or it fails the horizontal line test. And so we have f at x equals x squared subtract 3x plus 10. The derivative of that is 2x subtract 3 
make it equal to zero and solve it. And this is concave up, right? Parabola. So that means this is decreasing and, and increasing. So which interval is bigger? <laughs> Take some thinking here. This side is a little bigger than this side because negative infinity to 3 over 2 is a bigger gap than 3 over 2 to infinity, right? Oh, it says which one containing what? I got to read the question. That contains positive 1. Is that what it said? Yeah, that contains x equals positive 1. So positive 1 is on the left side. So negative infinity to 3 over 2. That's the interval that's monotonic that contains x equals 1. That there be an uh, inverse on that interval. Number 12. We have f at x equals uh, 12x subtract x cubed, and it's the interval that contains x equals 3. Let me show you my work. So take the derivative. So we're looking for increasing and decreasing. Make it equal to 0. I'm going to add 3x squared. I'm going to divide by 3. And so I get positive and negative 2. And so into the derivative, the one that contains 3 is uh, this interval right here. So there'd be 2 to infinity. So whatever that sign is, that's what it would be. So if you did do the sign for the derivative, it would be this. But ultimately, the interval that contains 3 would be 2 to infinity. Number 13. So for number 13, it's f at x equals x cubed, subtract 3x squared plus 3x. It doesn't give you a x value for the interval. So we're going to take the derivative, make it equal to 0. I'm going to divide everything by 3 just to make it easier. And then to factor it, it's negative 1 and negative 1 that multiply to positive 1, add to negative 2. So there's only one answer here. And the truth of the matter is, for this one, that into the derivative, if I plug in a negative number, you get a positive answer. And if you plug in a positive number, you get a positive answer. So the interval goes all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. Number 14, review questions. Can you take the derivative twice? So I'm going to write 1 over x as x to the negative 1 and then find the second derivative. There's the first derivative. I hope this is starting to get easier for you. And there's the second derivative. So again, we're multiplying and subtracting 1 to the exponent. We're multiplying, subtracting 1 to the exponent. Number 15. Just the first derivative. So the derivative of this would be 6 to the 2x. The hook on is 2, and it needs the hook on ln 6 because the base is 6. The derivative, oh, let's back up. So first we have to handle the exponent. So it's 4 and subtract 1, getting excited. The derivative of the base would be 6 to the t uh, 2x. The hook on is 2, and it needs an extra hook on of ln, and what the base is, the derivative of negative 3 is 0. That's much better. Number 16.
So again, you can use, I'm going to use the quotient rule to take the derivative. You could write it to take the product rule and get the same answer. So I'm going to do the quotient rule. That's the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom and then take the bottom and square it. Done. Just know your rules and follow your rules. That's nice. And the more you practice, the more you're going to remember them. Seventeen. Is g at t equals uh, 2t subtract 1 to the fifth and then again the second derivative. So the first derivative, and then as a hook on of 2, so that's really 10. I'm only simplifying it because I have to do it again. So the second derivative then would be 4 times 10. Subtract 1 to the exponent, and again it has a hook on of 2. So that's 80, or you can leave it that way. 18. Evaluate these integrals. So I'm integrating from negative 2 to 2. The absolute value of 3 quarters x to the fifth dx. And so for this one, because it's absolute value, I have to graph it. Or if you understand that I could actually integrate this. This is better understanding because it's a complicated absolute value. The absolute value makes this symmetric with the y-axis. So I can go from 0 to 2 and then double the answer. And that would be the same area. So then I can do the antiderivative. So add 1 to the exponent and divide. And we have a 3 quarters there. And the answer, actually, the 3 quarters could actually come in front too. And the 1 sixth. All of it can. So that's 2 times 3. That's 6 divided by 6. So really, that's 1 quarter. And then I can plug in the upper bound and then the lower bound. Do you know what 2 to the 6 is? That's 64. That's actually a nice answer. So the answer is 16. Number 19, this is where an even or odd function has a good understanding of it. Integrate from negative 1 to 0, e to the negative t plus 2 to the exponent 3. And then I'm going to write that as e to the negative t instead of a fraction. So instead of over e to the t, write as e to the negative t. The derivative of the base is e to the negative t, but it has a hook on that's negative. So we need a negative in front because of that hook on of negative t, which is negative 1. But now I can actually unhook this and then add 1 to the, and this is also part of the unhooking, that I can now add 1 to the exponent. And divide. And we're integrating from negative 1 to 0. Plug in the upper bound. Subtract. Plug in the lower bound. And you have your answer. Just double checking. Sound looks good. Number 20. Integrate. Y subtract 1, 3 times the 4th root 
of y dy. It's not as ugly as it looks. It's a monomial in the denominator, so I'm going to write this as two fractions. And I'm going to write that as a fractional exponent. So it's, this is what it should look like. So I write it as two fractions. And now I simplify with common bases. So this is really one third. One take away a quarter is positive three quarters. This is again one third. And then one over this is y to the negative one quarter. A little bit of algebra. I can factor out a one third in front to make the integration a little bit nicer to work with. So you add one to the exponent, the reciprocal. Add one to the exponent, the reciprocal. And oh, that's it. This uh, can go plus C. Perfect. Number 21. One more. This is an indefinite integral, so I'm reminding myself of that. So I don't want to get too tricky here. If I see the exponent 2, my first instinct is just to expand it to make it easier, to not do anything else. So what does that mean? Like what's root x plus 1 times root x plus 1? So if I expand it to make it easier, root x times root x, x root x, and another root x is 2 root x, and then 1 and 1. Don't, like you should be efficient with this with algebra. And then each one you can uh, integrate separately. Let me just write this calculus friendly. And then don't forget the plus c at the end. So we're adding 1, dividing. We're adding 1 and then the reciprocal, and then the antiderivative of one is x, and then the constant. And yeah, you could write it as four thirds. Number 22. Sketch the region bounded by x equals y squared subtract four and x equals y subtract 2. Set up an integral to find the area and then find the area without using a calculator. Okay. So I actually want to find the bounds first or the limits. So I'm going to make them equal to each other and then solve for y. So I'm going to subtract y, uh, add 2. I'm going to factor this and then solve it. So I know the upper and lower bounds. When I do my question, it's going to go from negative 1 to 2. I'd like a graph to know what's right and what's left. So if I take 2 and I plug it into here and make sure 2 is the y coordinate, the x coordinate is going to be 0. The second one is negative 1. And if I plug negative 1 here, negative 1 and negative 2 is negative 3. So I have negative 3 and negative 1. This is just a line, so that's like, there it is. This is a parabola that folds sideways. So here are two points on that parabola. I don't like the actual vertex doesn't affect much, but to actually be able to sketch it gives you an idea of the area that you're finding that's trapped. So now you can go right, subtract left. So on the right is the line, and in terms of y, it's x equals y subtract 2, so it's y subtract 2, and then the left is y squared subtract 4. So there's the setup. Uh, to actually find the area, 
we're going to combine like terms to make it a little bit simpler. So that's negative y squared, that's plus y, and then negative 2 subtract negative 4, that's positive 2. Integrate. Plug in the upper and the lower bounds, and you have your answer. Put parentheses. Can never put too many parentheses, honestly, as an instinct. And there it is, and you don't have to simplify it. Plug in the upper bound, plug in the lower bound, and there you go. Uh, 23. Set up but don't integrate an in, uh, integral for the volume of a solid formed by revolving what we just did about x equals negative 4. So take that. Where's x equals negative 4? Well, maybe the vertex would be helpful here. So... To find the vertex, the middle y value would actually help me find it. So the middle number between 2 and negative 1, the middle of that would be here. Well, here, this is a better way. So let's, I'm assuming negative 4 is to the left of it. If I plugged in negative 4 here, negative 4, negative 4 squared is 16, take away 4, which is 12. Yeah, It's to the left. And I'm going to take it and I'm going to revolve it. This is a washer. And what's important about this washer is to go right, subtract left. So the big radius goes through the area. So again, we're integrating from negative 1 to 2. These are circles. So it's pi. There's the template. Big radius, small radius. In terms of dy, right, subtract left. So on the right is the line y minus 2, and you subtract negative 4, which is subtracting a negative means you add 4. You don't have to simplify it. On the right side, the little radius, the right is the curve, which is y squared subtract 4. And again, we are subtracting negative 4, which is the same as adding 4. So yes, you could you could simplify this a little not necessary that's the setup to find the volume by revolving that around that's 23 24 all right i'm going to stop there let me just check my time yeah, I got to stop there. So I'm going to stop there, and then there'll be a second part. Mr. G Math over and out. I'm proud of you. I know this is not easy, but we're working together to get stronger in calculus. Till next time.